Uh, basically, what I want to talk about is delight. And, and uh, we've been actually studying customer complaint handling for over 40 years. Our claim to fame is we started the use of 800 numbers for customer service, and the, it costs five times as much to get a new customer as to keep one, and twice as many people hear about a bad experience as a good experience. That's all our research. Uh, and so about two years ago, we were replicating the White House study on complaint handling for the 10th time, and we had a client who said, you know, we really are interested in sponsoring the, 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 the uh, complaint study, but we really have a bunch of high-end customers who we'd be interested to see what, the, what can we do to delight them. And so all of a sudden we started looking at the other end of the scale. And so what we, we did was that we started looking at uh, delight. And, but first let me go through a little bit of basic behavior that we've seen over the past uh, 40 years. And even though you're using client feedback tool and you're aggressively soliciting complaints, most of your customers are not telling you about a lot of the points of pain that they have. And in fact, what we find in a consumer environment, for every complaint you hear, there's between five and 50 others out there. And in a B2B environment, there's at least two other clients out there who are not telling you about their problem because they're afraid of souring the relationship or they've complained in the past and nothing was done, so why bother? Uh, but they're still spreading word of mouth. And what we find is that people are now starting to change their channels. More and more of their interaction with you is digital, but you're gonna find in a minute that you can deliver delight digitally, which is something that really surprised us. Uh, also, the key point is delight is measurable and really powerful, especially in B2B environments. Now, the study that we did was sponsored by VIP Desk, which is one of the big outsourcers, and we went to 2,519 individuals. The, the big study is a study of consumers, but it carries over, you're gonna see, to B2B. And we looked at high-income individuals, split 50-50 male, female, and what, what we did was we said, have you had any delighted experiences in the last year? And about two-thirds of people said, yeah, I have had a delight experience. And then the other ones, we said, okay, you haven't had a delight experience, but let's talk about the best service experience you've had. And we used that sort of as a baseline. So we could see, okay, if you just had really good experience versus delight experience, what's the difference? And what we found was that the two biggest delighters were honesty and transparency. If you were honest, if you told me really how it was gonna work, that was really, really important. Also, if you provided unique knowledge, if you educated me. And we got as much impact from that as if you gave me a really great deal on price. And so what we're gonna find is that the human behaviors that don't cost a lot of money give you just as much impact as spending money, giving gifts, and doing a whole bunch of other things like that. Uh, also, another one, and this is really easy to do, was enthusiasm. I'd love to help you. At Zappos, there's someone who says, I am the superhero of lost shipments, and I love doing this. And that kind of enthusiasm really works very well. Also, empathy, hey, I've been there, I feel bad for you. Uh, and also, compliments. Uh, it, it, when I used to wear ties, I'd get on the airplane and the flight attendant would say, oh, I love your tie. And then to the person behind me, oh, I love the shawl you're wearing. So basically, what we find is that there's a bunch of human behaviors, one of which is humor, which Southwest Airlines does really well, uh, and that can make things memorable also. Now, I had suggested humor to the head of customer experience at Mercedes-Benz, and he looked at me and he said, we are not a humorous company. And, All right, it doesn't work for everybody. Uh, again, reinforcing, people are the strongest source of delight, and we then ask people, well, if you were delighted, would you be willing to pay more for this product or service? And what we found was at least 40%, and in some cases, 60% of people said, yeah, I'd be willing to pay more. So if you're systematically delighting people, you can raise your prices and your margins. And again, the transparency, 
the showed interest and concern, gave you compliments and enthusiasm, give you about 40% of people who said, yeah, I would pay more for that. And that's equivalent to the giving you a really good deal or giving you a bunch of freebies, which cost money. And again, the basic point is, these basic behaviors are as much of a payoff as spending extra money. But the one that was really neat was, you sold me other products and services. That's called cross-selling. But if I cross-sell you stuff you can actually use, I create delight. Now, the favorite example is Harley Davidson, which will sell you a bike for $30,000, and then they sell you another $25,000 worth of chrome to personalize your bike. And the margins are outrageous. But people love it. So basically, the cross-selling things that people want is one of the best ways of delighting. And by the way, you make a little bit of extra revenue at the same time. We then broke this out for about 12 industries. Uh, this is e-commerce. And you see on the left-hand side, again, honesty and enthusiasm and transparency are, are big delighters. But again, what we found was that if I was delighted versus I just was completely satisfied, I got really good service, if I was delighted, 39% more people said I would pay extra. So there's a real payoff for investing in delight. And Matt Dixon, who wrote the customer effort book, also wrote a book, in, an article in the Harvard Business Review entitled, Stop Trying to Delight Your Customers. We totally disagree. Our data shows that's absolutely not correct. There's a huge payoff. Uh, another thing that was really wild was that in e-commerce, 37% of the delight was delivered by email and another 24% by live chat. So you can deliver delight digitally, which means AI could even work in some of these areas because AI at least is smart enough to be able to show enthusiasm or empathy. We asked people uh, also, uh, how many people did you tell? And then we ask another question. We started doing this about 10 years ago at Neiman Marcus. You told six people, of those six, how many took action on your recommendation? Now, half of respondents say, I have no clue, but the other half said, well, you know, I, I think three people did. What we basically found was for each delighted customer, you potentially could generate two more customers. So the idea is, Delight is a word of mouth management process. And if you can get your, your word of mouth to be good enough, you don't need to do any marketing. At the Cheesecake Factory, their CEO says that their marketing expense is one quarter that of their direct competitors because, quote, we let our customers do our selling for us. Now, there was one thing that I don't have a good explanation for, which was we asked, did you post on social? And we found men posted twice as much as women. I don't know why that's the case. It's systematic across all the different industries. Now, I mentioned this applies to B2B. This is a major service uh, software as a service vendor. The average purchase is about half a million to a million dollars. And what we found was that when you exceeded their expectations, you had an 18 point lift in net promoter. So we're basically finding, this is finding that this absolutely applies in B2B. So uh, the last thing is, as I said, 48% of delight was delivered digitally, and people are now using email and chat, and you can use the enthusiastic and empathetic wording, and AI really works there. And video chat is the most effective, and Intuit has found that that eye contact you get zooming or having video chat raises trust 30%. Also, you get rapid connection. It's in minutes versus hours. You get a written record, and you can co-browse. So what are the four opportunities that I see from Delight? First, marketing and sales have to be transparent. This was the genesis of the question I asked yesterday on the onboarding, that do you warn customers about the three things that are, could be unpleasant surprises? We find that's critically important. When you get customers via word of mouth, they're less price sensitive and they're worth 25% more. And remember, transparency and honesty and education are key delighters. 
Also, the more education and the more transparent you are, the less time account reps are spending on fire drills. The second opportunity is onboarding, which is sort of concentrated transparency. And what we have found is there are two steps that most organizations skip before they get to, let me start educating you. Education is normally the first step. There's two things ahead of it. First, you want to flag the customer in terms of what kind of a customer are you? At Apple, a thousand years ago, we would say, are you a techno geek? Do you know just enough to be dangerous? Or are you a music major? And based on that, we had three completely different ways of talking to you. At Avis, they say, what kind of a renter are you? I love the latest cars and the fanciest technology. I'm a business traveler. I just want something with four wheels to get me out of the airport. I am Aunt Tilly on vacation. And the minute I know which of those you are, I know what's important to you. Secondly, you want to motivate people to get educated. I'm an engineer. I never read the directions. So how do you get me to do something? Well, you can scare me. You're going to have big problems unless you do this. You can bribe the person. Uh, we have a credit union that says, if you watch this four minute video, we'll give you a quarter point off your mortgage. And my reaction was, that's a lot of money. And they say, people who've watched this four minute video on how to get a mortgage are so much easier to do business with, it's worth it. You want to provide the basic education via multiple channels, and we're now finding that video is really helpful because I can go back and re see the video two or three times. Then, okay, we know you really don't want to talk to us. Here's how you self-service. And then, okay, you're now competent on our product. Let's talk about some of the advanced services that we can provide. And then finally, the last step is something no one does, which is evaluating the effectiveness of the onboarding process. Which of the different approaches is most effective for each different uh, segment? So the question I would ask in your company is, who's accountable for onboarding? In over half of companies that we've visited, no one's accountable. Sales and marketing make the sale, they run away to the next prospect, and then service is stuck well, here's what you should have been told that you really weren't told. Never happened in your companies, I realize. We actually have a paper on this also. Uh, in one internet service provider, we implemented effective onboarding, and what we found was that people who were effectively onboarded gave ratings on basic operational parameters 40% higher than those who were not effectively onboarded. And this is on stuff like the outages, the speed of download, sort of basic stuff. So the choice was you could spend a billion dollars on equipment or a million dollars on educating to properly set expectations. The third is you want to make response to delight effective across the board. Make delight intentional. And here you want to enhance service and proactive uh, uh, communication. And you also want to empower the front line so that they can answer just about everything with flex flexible solution spaces. This is at American Express. We said, OK, for this difficult issue, there are four ways of handling it. Use your best judgment. And so you don't need to escalate. They have the ability to handle that difficult situation. You then want to weave in delight actions at little or no cost. And this idea of proactivity, people want to know where you are in the process. You're all doing projects. The Domino's Pizza Tracker is something you should all have. We have a construction company we've worked with. They do high-end renovations, half million dollars and up. And they read the wife, who tends to be the project manager, into the project management software. And what they have found is that if the wife goes into the project management software once a week, the number of fire drills and disasters go down 80%. Now, project managers were scared to death. We're opening our kimono and letting people see how disorganized we are. 
Yeah, that's true, but better that they are read in than not. So you want to then weave in delight that simple things are enthusiasm, empathy, and transparency. The cross-selling and humor are a little bit harder, but, but definitely makes sense. We did an experiment with, with one beauty counter company where we took one team and trained them on delight, doing the enthusiasm and empathy for two hours. We then had them handle 2,500 contacts versus a control group, and we got a four-point lift in top box ratings just with two hours of training. So you can train people to be enthusiastic very, very easily. Even engineers can be trained. Finally, you need to modify your metrics. If you have a five-point scale, the top box is always very satisfied. Okay, if we're now saying there's a sixth box, delighted, what do you do? In some cases, we've had to relabel box five delighted, and then box four is very satisfied. We think a better approach is to have a six-point scale where you've got five is very satisfied, six is delighted. You have to be able to measure the delight because then you can measure the impact on margin, loyalty, and word of mouth. Uh, make it intentional, build it into evaluations, and one point I'll just make is when you're evaluating your staff, most of the world says, okay, we're going to look at six to 10 interactions that you've had in the last month or the last quarter. That's a statistical sample. No, it's not a statistical sample. It's criminal. So basically, our idea is that in most cases, you shouldn't be doing a random sample like that. Also, uh, a lot of people focus on Net Promoter and Net Promoter 3.0, which came out last November. Uh, I've got a whole paper on what's wrong with that. I actually have a paper I did a while back entitled Net Promoter is Like Global Warming, Lots of Hand-Wringing and Very Little Action. Uh, we are not fans of Net Promoter. So in summary, there are three strategies. You want to prevent problems, and that's where the education and transparency come in. You want to respond effectively using AI and empowerment, and you need to get feedback on how you're doing. And so there are four areas, sales and marketing transparency, customer onboarding, enhancing service to make delight intentional, and then do the measurement necessary to see what's working and what's not. Hopefully I've stimulated your thinking in a number of areas. And um, at that point, questions or complaints? I, I think that we're just about out of time, but we've got probably time for two or three questions or complaints. You guys, uh, pull out the Poll Everywhere app. You guys remember the Poll EV? If you have any questions for John. Ah, I love that. Is it time to ditch NPS completely? Uh, it is so general that I think that it is. And to a degree, I think the reason they came out with Net Promoter 3.0 was because customer effort has now surpassed it. Uh, but the critical thing is granularity. Uh, you can't fix billing. You can't fix uh, onboarding. You have to fix specific granular aspects of that. So we basically find you have to go to the points of pain level. And the, the one thing that I would add is that you need to really aid the customer with a list of the points of pain. Because in many cases, customers are too polite to talk about, well, that sales rep is sort of a dim bulb, uh, or I was misled by, by your literature. And the last example I'll give on this is, we were working with an insurance company and I had, uh, uh, I was misled by your agent, I was misled by your literature. The general counsel calls up and says, you can't have those on the list because if anybody checks them off, we've committed fraud. My answer back was, would you rather not know? All right, leave it on. And in fact, there were big issues. So you need to have the granularity, and, and you, at least from Net Promoter, have to build a bridge to the granularity. Uh, the slides are absolutely available, uh, and the most compelling point to get executives on board is 
look at our attrition, whatever that is, or our churn, and one half of that churn, this is across over a thousand companies we've worked with, one half of the churn that you're currently facing is due to points of pain that are preventable. So that gives you, you know, if, if your churn is, is 5% a year, 2.5%, you can say this is the amount of revenue that's due to points of pain, and that's all preventable if we take action. And so the idea is to do a quantification of for each month we don't take action, how much revenue are we leaving on the table. Um, delights trigger different customer sets. Uh, we basically have found that the delighters, because all customers or most customers are human beings, the delighters seem to be the same across the board. Now, giving me, giving me a little gift when I'm doing a million dollar contract probably isn't, isn't all that important, but if you're giving me useful information, again, it's educating me to avoid hassles helping me be successful, uh, and if you're educating me on innovative approaches, what we've found in, in working with architects and engineers and lawyers and accountants is they wanna know what's the next big trend. So if you are educating people on that, then I think that, and, and if you're the source of innovation uh, or the knowledge, all of a sudden people will pay a premium. And, uh, so we find people, even in a commodity market, you can command a premium if you are viewed as the innovator and the thought leader. And thank you, John.